Welcome to the session 3.3, uh, which is a session on FX and informal workers. This is uh, a session jointly organized by Wider and Vivo. One of two sessions. This is the first session. The second session will happen on September 8th, session 6.1, 1700 to 1745 Eastern European time. Let me give a little bit of background behind these two sessions because it's important for all of us to understand. So the, the background is that this session and the session on the 8th of September uh, the contributors in the sessions, the presenters and the discussions will be contributing to a book volume that, will be, that is being uh, put together by Marty, Mike and myself. Uh, we have a title of the, bo of the book, uh, Marty and Mike. We might change it later, but let me tell you the, the title. It's called Informal Employment and Labor Markets, Insights and Reflection from the Era of COVID-19. So the book volume. And just to give a background behind this particular book volume, I'm going to, make a, I'm going to quote from an ILO report that came out last year. COVID-19 in the world of work, just to very quickly uh, provide a context. The quotation, quoting ILO here, almost 1.6 billion informal economy workers account for 76% for of informal employment worldwide, are significantly impacted by the lockdown measures and all working in the hardest hit sectors. They often have poor access to healthcare services and have no income replacement in case of sickness or lockdown. Many of them have no possibility to work remotely from home. Staying home means losing their jobs and without wages, they cannot eat. Income losses for the informal economy workers are likely to be massive. This is really the background behind why Marty, Mike and I decided to put this book volume together. And what we have thought about in this book volume, and this, this is reflected in the two sessions, we're going to try and address three questions. And I'll read, I'll read out the questions. The first question we'll address, this is the session today, is how has the informal economy been affected by the pandemic and short-term policy responses? And how have different groups of informal workers classified by inter alia status in employment and occupation been affected? So what do we know about the effects of the pandemic on informal workers? That's the session today. The session on the 8th of September, session, the second session, session 6.1, is on the second and third questions of the book volume. The second question is, beyond immediate or short-term relief measures, what have we learned about recovery and stimulus measures in different countries and among different groups of workers? And the third question behind the book volume is really looking forward. What does the COVID-19 crisis tell us about the future of informal employment and the origin of labor markets and economies? So that's the session that will occur on the, the second and third crucial address in the, in the second session. And let, let's start now with this session. And let me introduce the, the presenters and, and, and the discussants. We have a very rich uh, and very distinguished set of presidents and discussants. I will just simply uh, uh, provide the names and affiliation because there's really not much time to give formal introductions. Uh, the presenters are Robert Osei, Yisar University of Ghana, Mike Rogan, Wigo and Rhodes University, Marty Chen, Wigo, Harvard Kennedy School, and also chair the wider board. And then we have uh, Anzilu Rawan, the Power and Participation Research Center. And we hope that Zilu will be with us very shortly. Oh, there it is. There's Zilu. Good to see you, yeah. Zilu. Thank you. <laughs> All right. That's great. And then we have discussions. So we have two very distinguished discussions Imran Valodia, Wits University, and Ravi Kanbur, um, who knows Wider for a very long time, Cornell University. Okay. So we could have six minutes per presentation. I don't know if I need to give you a, a time warning or not. I prefer not to. But I might give you a warning at six minutes then each. And then four minutes for discussion. And again, I'll give you a warning when you cross when you hit four, four minutes because you just want to keep some time for QA. So, Robert, you're the first presenter. We have the slides, and Katy is going to show the slides. So as soon as Katy puts it up, you can start speaking. Thanks. Thank you. So Thank you very much. And um, so what we are looking at here is how the COVID, particularly the response of government to the COVID affected um, urban workers in Ghana. Um, generally, um, can we move to the next slide, please? Um, for Ghana, following the first cases of the COVID, we had the government react and then um, institutes a partial lockdown in certain parts um, of um, the country. 
more specifically the two. Robert, you're muted. We cannot hear you. We oh. I can hear him. So really? can I. Yes. I can hear him. Yes. I can hear I him. Am, I am not muted. Yeah, Kachi, I think the problem is not, not at uh, Robert's end. It's probably, uh, again, I don't know what, where it is, but Robert, we can hear loud and clear. Robert, go ahead. Okay. Thank you very much. So, and I wasn't, uh, the slides were not moving anyway, so I have a printout here so I can speak to it. Um, the two largest areas that we actually um, experienced the partial lockdown were the greater Accra um, metropolis and then the Kumasi metropolis area, which essentially recorded also the first cases of the COVID and therefore naturally the government wanted to stop the spread of the disease and therefore uh, implemented the partial lockdown in this area. And essentially what it meant was that except for essential services, people actually could not leave their homes to go out or except for people going out to buy um, essentials, food and medication. Next slide, please. And so what we did was um, in terms of the study design was to build on the Ghana Socioeconomic Panel survey, and we drew a sample of 650 or so respondents from the Ghana Socioeconomic Panel survey, some of which were in the lockdown areas and some outside of the lockdown areas. And we actually asked them questions relating to um, the labor market outcomes, but also in terms of welfare indicators, how the incomes fed as well as um, food security questions. And for the questions that we asked the respondents, they were three different um, recall periods. The first was February 2020, which preceded the COVID-19. And then there was the April 2020 when the lockdown was actually in force. And then in September, the lockdown was lifted in May, and so September was period after the lockdown, and this enabled us to actually assess what actually uh, whether the lockdown had impacted on labor market outcomes, but also whether there was uh, recovery after the lockdown. Next, please. Next slide, please. So, um, generally, one note that the impact of the COVID actually. Um, based on the respondents uh, was actually manifest in employment and income loss. And so majority of the respondents did indicate that uh, employment and income loss was the um, impact they thought was a, uh, the source of the impact of the COVID. And if you look at even for the employment and um, the income source, that, that particular response is very pronounced for the informal those who are in the informal uh, sector relative to the formal um, sector. And so even there, you do find heterogeneity. Next slide, please. Now, if you look at the lockdown area versus the no lockdown area, um, as at April when the lockdown was in place, the level of employment had decreased significantly in the lockdown area relative to the no lockdown area, which essentially will uh, hint that um, the impact of the lockdown was actually directly on employment. Okay, of course, that then manifests itself and translates into income losses, and therefore, in terms of uh, food security as well. Next slide, please. Like I also mentioned earlier, we do find heterogeneity across um, the different um, functional groups of uh, the employment. Those who are in this uh, informal self-employed group experienced the largest hit with respect to the um, partial lockdown. And you can understand why that is the case, where these set of um, respondents could not actually, they needed on a day-to-day -day basis, be out there uh, interacting with uh, other agents um, for their daily upkeep. And so the lockdown meant that 
the whole economic activities of this set of um, individuals came to a standstill or was shut down. And for most of them as well, they couldn't actually translate um, some of the um, loss in the physical contact through um, to um, the IT platforms that some of the formal sector areas could do. Next slide, please. And for the majority of the respondents, they argued that um, the loss in income was essentially driven by government's restrictions. And you can understand why, again, uh, given that uh, the, 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 their daily activities relied on actually having to go out, whether it was the barbering shop, whether it was the saloon, or whether it was those who were just hawking on the streets, they essentially relied on having to go out to make their daily living. Next slide, please. So following the removal of the lockdown, we see that the employment effect was completely reversed. And so the difference between the no lockdown and the lockdown was almost um, equalized. And so strong recovery after the lockdown was actually lifted. However, the general effect of the COVID still persisted um, in the economy um, after the, um, due to uh, the COVID, sorry. Uh, Robert, uh, 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Can I go to the last slide, please? I believe, yes. So three main findings. One is that the lockdown measures had an immediate impact on uh, labor markets. Um, it did cause a decline in employment. Uh, second is that the impact was largely felt by the informal self-employed. And then third, we do find some recovery uh, in employment due to the lockdown. However, the effect of the pandemic generally still persists even when the lockdown was lifted. Thank you very much. Thank you, Robert, for keeping your time. That was excellent. Uh, we now move on to Mike Rogan. Uh, Mike from Vigo and Rhodes University. And again, Cathy is uh, controlling the slides. Mike, go ahead. Great, thanks. Uh, am I coming through okay? Yep. All right. Uh, I'm going to try and match the previous speaker in terms of time. Um, so I'll go straight to it, uh, to the next slide, please. Um, and what I'll be doing here is outlining the impact of the, of the crisis on, on the South African labor market. Uh, and the analysis here is based on our official uh, national labor force surveys. I mean, first of all, the the overall impact of the of the crisis has been devastating for the South African labor markets. Uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, of 2.2 to 2.8 million jobs were lost in the at the beginning of the crisis. Uh, one of the speakers in in a session earlier today uh, described it as 10 years of job growth in South Africa uh, lost over a six month period. So a real setback, um, uh, to say the least. Another way to describe it is uh, the job losses have been uh, roughly double the impact of the, the previous shock to the labor markets uh, during the 2008-9 glo uh, global financial crisis. But not notably in both of these crises, uh, the impacts have been disproportionately felt by uh, the informal economy. In fact, that was a, a notable outcome from the, from the previous crisis. Um, in the next slide, uh, I think we can see probably better than in any other um, uh, slide that I have here, the, the sheer scale of the, of the loss of informal jobs relative to, to formal jobs. Uh, I'm deliberately using the term informal employment, not informal sector uh, in this presentation. Uh, so I'm looking at all informal jobs, not just those uh, within the informal sector. We have quarterly labor force survey uh, data in South Africa. Uh, so what you can see on the screen in front of you are quarterly year on year relative uh, decreases in informal and formal employment. Um, for each quarter, uh, the first bar on the left uh, denotes the decrease in informal employment 
the second light gray bar denotes the decrease in formal employment. And then the third bar uh, is a combination of the two. That's uh, decreases in total employment. So if we just start uh, towards the left of the graph there where it says Q2, this captures the employment losses during what's generally been described as one of the world's harshest government lockdowns. This was a period of roughly three weeks where uh, we weren't allowed to leave our homes. So obviously most forms of employment that, that couldn't be done online were, uh, were essentially impossible to, um, to engage in. And here we can see the stark differences between job losses in, in the informal economy and in informal employment. Uh, the, the relative declines from the previous year were, were roughly 29%. Uh, so the, so job, informal jobs decreased by about 29% compared with a, a decrease of about 8% uh, among uh, formal jobs. So an absolutely uh, stark difference between job losses between the informal economy and, and those in formal employment. As you move to the uh, to the right, you can see the results for quarter three and quarter four. Uh, job losses were uh, year on year somewhat less severe, which is understandable uh, given the fact that the, the lockdown had eased. But nonetheless, the differences in job losses between uh, the, the formal economy and the informal economy persist uh, year on year across all four quarters in, in 2020. Uh, next slide, please. Another way to, to consider how the, um, the labor market responded over the, over the past five quarters, including the, uh, the beginning of the current year, uh, is to look at different categories of, of informal employment uh, and compare them uh, chronologically quarter by quarter. So this is the way that the, the pandemic unfolded in South Africa. Uh, you can see the second quarter of 2020, I've marked a red line for the, that first quite severe uh, lockdown. Uh, following that, in the next quarter, uh, came the, the first wave of the pandemic itself. And then in the final quarter of, of 2020, uh, the second severe lockdown coincided uh, with the second wave of the, the pandemic itself. And what you can see across all types of employment, uh, the blue and the, and the gray bars denotes uh, informal employment as a whole, the informal economy for uh, men and women, respectively. And then the yellow and the orange lines denote men's and women's informal sector uh, employment, uh, respectively. And the characteristic shape, and I think you'll see this in a couple presentations in this session, is a, is a large dip um, uh, between quarter one and quarter two of 2020, followed by a very muted recovery. Uh, there are a few signs of, of recovery, in, in particular with um, men's informal sector employment in the in the third quarter of 2020 but by and large and, and particularly if we were to consider the the confidence intervals of these of these trends i think we'd see a very muted recovery uh, so very um very persistent effects following that uh, severe lockdown uh, and and very little evidence of recovery amongst most groups of, of informal workers uh, next slide please The other way to look at uh, the uneven effects of, of the crisis are to look at uh, different groups of, of informal workers. Uh, so this is another uh, graph showing year on year changes by quarter. Uh, but now I'm looking at uh, own account workers in the informal sector, informal sector employers, informal sector employees, formal sector employees, and uh, informal workers in private households, largely domestic workers. And what you can see is that in the in the last three quarters of 2020, the two groups that I've circled there, uh, those denote two types of employees, informal sector employees and formal sector employees who are employed informally. Uh, these two groups seem to bear the brunt of the, the pandemic. And as you can see, as we move to the right, as, as, the, as the quarters unfold in 2020, uh, very muted recoveries from uh, between these two particular groups of informal workers. So for example, by, by quarter four of 2020, uh, informal sector employees uh, um, still had 25% fewer jobs than they did in the same quarter in the, in the previous year. Mike, um, 30 seconds, that's okay. Yeah, great, thanks. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, 
this just suggests that the two main sectors, um, industrial sectors of the informal economy, uh, retail and private households also had uh, quite similar trends. So these are the main employers in the informal economy, a large dip in the second quarter of 2020, followed by uh, very muted recoveries. Uh, final slide. Yeah, so the takeaway from South Africa is evidence for a large, disproportionate and uh, persistent decrease in informal employment, particularly uh, in relation to formal employment. Women in private households in the informal sector have been particularly vulnerable. And if we look at different groups uh, by status and employment, uh, the absolute decreases were largest among own account workers in the informal sector, while the relative decreases were larger and more persistent amongst employees, both inside and outside of the, the informal sector. Um, so thank you very much. We now move on to Marty Chen. All right, Marty, <laughs> over to you then. Okay, thank you, Kanal, for sharing the vision behind the uh, wider WeGo volume and panels. And I'm presenting um, the results um, from the 2020 survey and, and study and also the 2021 preliminary findings from an 11 city study. Next slide. Uh, in five regions of the world, uh, we had a sample drawn from the membership of local organizations of informal workers, a purposive sample of over 2,000 and four main occupational groups, uh, domestic workers, home-based workers, street vendors, and waste pickers. And we partnered in our research with these local organizations of informal workers and of course, local research teams. Um, I should note that the map shows 12 cities. We excluded Dar es Salaam from the analysis because the government of Tanzania uh, was in COVID denial during 2020. Next. The methods we used, uh, which we always use, is a mix of a survey questionnaire. Excuse me, am I the only one who can't hear, Marty? Um, I can, Ravi. Me too. Okay. Uh, well, I can, I'm I missing. Can. Anyway, it doesn't matter. I can hear Marty, actually. Okay, okay. that's good. Okay. Well, I'll just wait. <laughs> I hope the majority can hear. <laughs> so we used, as we always do, a mix of a survey questionnaire and in-depth interviews to help us understand context and interpret findings. And the interviews were with um, the organizations of the workers, informal worker leaders themselves, and depending on the city, other stakeholders from government private sector and civil society. And we did two rounds of the survey, mid 2020, mid 2021, and both times we had different recall periods. So our recall was very much like what Robert said for 2020. We looked at February, 2020 as pre-COVID and April, 2020 as the peak restrictions. We found that to be the peak restrictions around the world. And in round two, the recall is previous month and last 12 months. Next. So when we look at the findings from uh, round one, very much similar to what both Robert and Mike have reported, the lockdowns and restrictions in April 2020 led immediately to a triple crisis of work income and food security. And by mid 2020, as the restrictions were eased, recovery was slow, particularly of earnings. More specifically during April, 2020, 74% of the respondents were not able to work. And the average earnings had dropped to 19% of pre-COVID earnings. By mid-2020, nearly 80% were able to work, but average earnings had recovered to just over half of pre-COVID earnings. And so a common refrain we heard around the world last year is, we will die of hunger, not the virus. We also, of course, looked at heterogeneity, uh, less by status and employment like the previous two, 
uh, presentations and more by occupational groups. And um, what we found was that home-based workers and street vendors uh, were the most affected, the least likely to work in the peak lockdowns. And the home-based workers were the least able to recover um, during mid-2020. And uh, just an aside, there's a lot of attention to home-based work because all of us are working remotely. But just to say that traditional home-based workers are not working remotely, so to speak. Uh, they are producing goods and services from in and around their home, but they depend on being able to contact suppliers and buyers. Next. So one of the distinct features of this study is that we looked not just at the degree of impact, but the pathways of impact by these four sectors. And let me just walk you through it. So for domestic workers, the real issue was whether their employers were willing to hire them. And we found quite a pronounced difference between live-in domestic workers who were allowed to continue working and live out who often lost um, jobs. For the home-based workers, there was a whole issue of decreased demand for the goods and services they provide. Um, both domestic and export. And we found in some contexts that the factories um, that produce textiles or garments were closed for lengths of time. And uh, there was decreased local demand um, for the self-employed from buyers and customers and work orders for the subcontracted. And in this sector, we found that the self-employed were able to do a bit better than the subcontracted who were completely dependent on the factories or firms for, uh, for contracts. When it came to street vendors and informal market traders, um, again, there was decreased demand, but particularly for non-food items during the peak restrictions. There, was close, there were closures of the natural markets of street vendors and also built markets. There was closure of uh, wholesale markets, and that meant reduced um, um, prices uh, for, uh, I'm sorry, increased prices for stock and reduced prices for the goods they sold. And for the waste pickers, um, there was a decreased overall supply of waste. People were generating less waste, not just people, but firms and factories. There was a closure of dump sites and sorting areas, and there was decreased demand and prices for the reclaimed recyclable items. And we found that women were less able than men, waste pickers, to be able to negotiate this changed environment to access and sell the waste. Next. Of course, there were also differences uh, between cities. Uh, and the main reasons for these uh, differences, in addition to the composition of the sample, was the severity and duration of the pandemic, the intensity and duration of the lockdown or other restrictions, the coverage and amount of government cash or food aid, and there was quite marked differences and then the stance of local government towards the informal workers during the lockdowns or restrictions, whether they were deemed essential, and if so, whether they were allowed to work and provided with PPE. And then after the lockdowns or restrictions were eased, whether they were continued to be treated punitively, whether they faced harassment, bribes, uh, confiscation of goods, uh, destruction of or eviction from their work sites, and whether they were included in economic recovery uh, schemes. Next. Next slide, thank you. So what is the current situation? We do have preliminary findings from mid-2021. Uh, among the ability to work question, uh, around 90% of uh, domestic workers, street vendors, market traders, and waste pickers, plus 65% of home-based workers are able to work, but most are working fewer days per week and earning less. 
Around 30% of the sample households reported hunger among adults and or children during the past year. Most sample households are deeply in debt. Around 80% do not have any savings left and many have not been able to redeem or replace the goods that they, the assets that they had mortgaged or sold in 2020. I should also note that governments in most study uh, cities or countries have not uh, mounted relief efforts during the second or third waves of the virus cum restrictions. So relief aid is greatly diminished and governments in most study cities or countries have not included informal workers in their economic recovery plans. Next. Monetary, oh, thank you. That's very good. Okay. Great. Just one more. Just one more. Right. Next, please. <laughs> Perhaps arguably the most important finding from our study is the demands of the informal workers and their organizations for relief, recovery, and reforms. Um, they want financial assistance to pay off debts and restore savings and assets. They need recovery support, cost, cash grants, and public procurement, social protection, not just uh, cash grants, but also social insurance. They want an enabling policy and legal environment at the national level and at the local level. And I've itemized the specific demands at the urban level. And a lot of it has to do with abuse by police and authority that criminalize them and don't allow them to operate. And of course, they would like to be included, have their organizations represented in urban governance. Thank you. Thank you, Marty. Now we move to the fourth presentation by Zilu Hussein Rahman from Power Public Participation Research Center, uh, Bangladesh. Zilu, over to you. And slides it right in front. Yeah, thank you. I'll start with the nature of the evidence. Second slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay, as they are getting it. Uh, so we uh, we are trying to understand the impact. Not at one point in time, we looked. We had four data points: pre-COVID, severe lockdown, early recovery, and late recovery. And as you know, after the late recovery, there has been again another wave. So this dynamic part was important for us to capture. First evidence source is a panel study, 6,000 plus household, where we also had the pre-COVID information. Uh, and this was between a collaboration between PPRC and the Bragg Institute of Governance and Development. We also had a second PPRC study in partnership with UNICEF on rickshaw pullers of Dhaka City. Again, looking at uh, not just the COVID impact, but overall the economic situation. So those two studies uh, are from the basis of what I'm going to say now. Uh, can we move to the next, the third slide? Uh, yeah, the next one. Yeah, so I really not uh, go through the graphs because they are already there, but summarize the findings in these five vulnerabilities where we see if we take the, uh, you know, like the peak COVID to mid of 2021, uh, what has been the five vulnerabilities? And our sample has been mostly focused on the informal occupation. So the first one, which I think uh, Marty also has highlighted, is that there has been activity recovery, but not commensurate earnings recovery. You know, both these studies point to the same thing. One year on, urban slump households of Bangladesh uh, we're still having 17% uh, pre-COVID income. Uh, some because below their pre-COVID income. And the Mitropola study also shows similar 18% below pre-COVID income. But activity recovery has been uh, more pronounced, but has been uneven, of course, across uh, occupation. So that's the first thing to highlight. Second one, this is also important, I think the the sort of an instability in the labor market. And you know, I'm not showing the graphs because that's in the interest of time. The second insight is that there has also been significant occupational instability. 
one year on, we found that 50% had returned to their pre-COVID employment, but 41% had shifted to another type of employment, which was quite a high figure. And in terms of the shift, we saw a distinct, uh, you know, it was a shift towards lesser skilled jobs. Even, for example, the informal sector, small teacher, you know, how the home tutor type was now having to do almost like menial labor. That sort of a transition that was in so. So that's a, another important uh, thing to look at. The third one, again, I think Marty also has mentioned this, is that yes, there has been this broad impact on informal education as a whole. But I think we also need to unpack the impact on across the occupation because there has been uneven impact. For example, transport sector, rickshaw puller, small business, even skilled labor among the informal occupation have had more difficulty in terms of uh, their uh, you know, earnings and their occupational uh, uh, livelihoods. Women have found it more difficult to re-enter the labor market when they were kicked out during the uh, lockdown period. So differential impact across occupations. The fourth, I think, is an important one. What we found also was that much of this, you know, the urban sample in particular, what we found was that the non-food expenditure burdens on informal occupation households, particularly in the city, had nearly doubled over this period. Let's not even talk of social protection. The regular non-food uh, expenditure had doubled and that triggered a process of what I've called reverse migration. Some of those informal occupation have had to trudge back out of the cities. They essentially kicked out of the cities into less remunerative, uh, smaller cities or uh, villages. And we, we found that over a year, about 10%, you know, some came back, but net over a year, we found 10% were still, uh, had not come back. The fifth uh, insight that I want to highlight is that because, you know, since our last survey, we are doing a fourth round now, you know, new lockdown phases are likely to come. What we find is that the informal occupation household have eroded financial capacity. We got the figures, the debt to household income ratio has doubled over the pre-COVID to uh, April 2021 period. So we have this five uh, big vulnerabilities uh, affecting these people. If we can go to the last slide now of my presentation. Uh, I, can we just move uh, forward, please? Yeah. These are the figures you, you can look at this later. Uh, last slide, please. Because there I draw some down, 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 down. This one, uh, that's one, that's one. Yeah, so I, uh, I find three implications for policy and discourse. First one is that government response has been uh, not been a big part of the story of coping with COVID. Or it ha there has been some, but it is not a big part of the story. One of the reasons in the Bangladesh context is that social protection has primarily been focused on the rural poor. So in a way, COVID-19 crisis has forced urban social protection agenda onto the policy uh, table. The, uh, that's an important move, but policy appetite remains low, and we are having to nudge it through strategy to get focused. The second one is that this issue of differential impact. It's not enough just to say there is a differential impact. And I feel that uh, what we are trying to do also is to get a, try to get an analytical typology of informal occupation in terms of their vulnerability and how they interface with the mesoeconomy. In particular, I think this idea of the mesoeconomy is something that we are trying to grapple with to try to understand. Can we do a typology of informal occupations in terms of their long-term uh, sustainability and long-term vulnerability? 
the third and final uh, insight that I want to highlight is that we also did a you know uh, opinion survey of the rickshaw pullers and what and of our largest survey with the uh, informal occupations of urban and rural Bangladesh. And at the end of the day, what we found is that while COVID impact must exercise our attention, it is the longer term systemic disadvantages on economic and service opportunity, which actually is the larger concern of this urban informal workers. For example, urban primary health care uh, is not there. The health care cost burdens are huge. As I said, non-food expenditure has doubled, which means that the focus of policy is not on those areas which uh, make it... Uh, in a way, the conclusion there is that it is quite expensive to be poor in a city like Dhaka. That's a contradictory conclusion, but that's how I say that the together with the focus on the impact of COVID, the systemic disadvantages must also become or remain, or in a way, uh, we must take a new look at the systemic disadvantages and get the policy attention on both the addressing the COVID impact, but also the systemic disadvantages. Just to conclude, the urban poor social indicators are actually worse than the rural poor social indicators in Bangladesh. That tells you about a story of the lack of policy attention uh, where for the urban poor, some economic opportunity is provided by the policy mindset. But the social variables, health, education, housing, transport, etc., are not really figuring in the policy mindset. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Zilur. It was a very clear and concise presentation. Now we have now two discussions. First, Imran Balodia and then Ravi Kanbur. Imran, if you don't mind, four minutes, please, for your comments. Great. Um, so, um, what we have here is, is uh, kind of across all of the, the, the countries and all of the cities. I think the kind of general finding that comes out consistently is that the kind of impact on the informal economy has been much worse than it is in has than than in in, in than uh, 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 than on the formal economy, and I think in the recovery phase, the kind of recovery has been a lot slower in the informal economy than it has in the other parts of the economy. And I think in kind of general, the, 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 the sense is that COVID has, has either permanently destroyed an, a large n, a number of livelihoods uh, kind of in the informal, uh, kind of in the informal economy, or else even when those livelihoods have re, uh, re, Covered the, the levels of income are substantially below what they were prior to the to the uh, pen, uh, pandemic, and I think that finding applies across all of the cities and all of the the the, the uh, countries in in the excellent presentations that we've had. So, what might what what might it look like in the in in the next few? Uh, Kind of in the next few years, and and what might be the the policy kind of issues for us to think about. So I'm pretty pessimistic uh, about the possibilities in the medium term for two reasons really. The the first is that the more we kind of learning about the the nature of this pandemic, the the and 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 the more we we learn about the health dimensions of it. I think it's quite clear that the kind of ideas about some sort of herd immunity are, 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 are kind of something that is that, that, that no longer applies, and that we we are likely to have many many waves of kind of off the pandemic in the in the in. At, at, can't really impacting 
livelihoods in the informal economy in a negative way. And I think secondly, if we look at the studies on pen pandemics in general, the the kind of medium term effects tend to be more kind of pronounced than the short term than the than the short term impacts. So I think for both of those reasons, we should expect this trend to to kind of continue, and then that then raises what should be the key policy levers that we should be thinking about to 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 kind of reduce the burden on the most vulnerable sections of the population. And and here I have three three thoughts. The first is clearly vaccinations are the only possible way in which we can kind of return to some level of, a, of, of, of what we might think of as, as normal. Um, and, and kind of here, I, th I think the kind of issues about the, the kind of international and national di dimensions of the kind of inequalities in kind of access to vaccinations uh, uh, can, I think are quite, uh, uh, we've, we've, we, we, we know those quite well. I think from the South African experience, the, the, the point that might be worth worth pursuing is the nature of the of the rollout uh, uh, in the south african case we we've not managed to get the vaccinations to to kind of places where where kind of informal workers really are so so they should be at sort of all of the taxi ranks they should be in uh, in in kind of informal settlements they should be in in kind of areas of of the city where where um, uh, 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 people tend tend to move and i think the the the, the rollout of of vaccination programs and the role of the local state in that i think is really uh, kind of important. I think point two is Marty, Mike and, and in fact all of the, the, the papers highlighted the, the, the vulnerability through different sort of periods of the lockdown points to the importance of, of how we think about the fiscal adjustment processes. I, I think pre uh, Kind of premature uh, 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 fiscal adjustment is is a is a real issue, and and I think we should be pushing a lot more for m much more uh, 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 careful consideration about how these fiscal adjustments happen. Final point, I think Marty's points around what the the workers are are kind of demanding. Get, give us really useful pointers for how we should think about the, a, 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 a post-COVID growth project. Um, the, the, the fiscal adjustments, the, the fiscal measures can, can only deal with the immediate crisis. I think if we, if we want to think about making livelihoods sustainable, we kind of going to have to think a lot more about how we build in a uh, 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 kind of informal economy uh, uh, policy issues within longer term growth plans, and I think if if there's one good thing that could perhaps come out of the the the, the uh, 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 pandemic, it's the it's the possibility for a growth strategy that I think would 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 build livelihoods of informal work us into that, rethink how we think things like like kind of transport systems, uh, kind of health provision, uh, social protection, social insurance, etc. So I'll, I'll stop there, Jay. Thanks so much, Imran. Really important points there. Um, Ravi, uh, four minutes and over to you as a, as a final discussant, please. Thank Good. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Kunal. So uh, I've been thinking about my contribution to the volume. And I thought what I would do is to probably step back a little bit from the specifics of the study and just make, make three points, uh, which I've made in other, other writings, but I, what I want to highlight uh, uh, here. Uh, 
The first point, which I think is very clear from the from these studies, is that the consequences of mic of macro shocks are quite micro, so to speak. They're quite granular. They're quite differentiated, uh, and the dis particularly in the distributional consequence, it comes through in Zillow's study, in uh, the studies that in Robert and uh, all of the studies it comes through. Of course, the formal informal divide is the is the level is the granularity that's most emphasized. But even within the informal sector, and one would suppose even within the formal sector, there's a tremendous uh, differentiation. Why is that? And I think uh, Robert's presentation, I think, used the phrase proximity or density. Uh, and clearly, when you have this sort of pandemic type effects, it's the degree of proximity, it's the degree of density, uh, clearly in the workplace, but also actually in the residence, uh, place of residence, and in the commute between residence and work. It's the, it's the proximities, uh, or the structural proximities that I think, in fact, determine uh, the, the, spread of this, the, the spread of this thing. So there's a lot of emphasis on proximity by you know differentiating occupations and so on in these studies on the in the workplace, but I didn't see the same degree of emphasis on proximity in the residence uh, area and also proximity in the transportation from residence to work. So I think that's something analytically that we might we might uh, think about. Uh, secondly, uh, I think if one if one takes this logic, then uh, some sort of a general quantification of the connection between proximity and informality or density and informality, I think, is something that will be called for, uh, uh, both in terms of empirics. But secondly, what's the logic? What is the logic behind, the economic logic behind, why it is that informal sector activities generally, let's suppose it's true, are, are, uh, are dense, are densely concentrated? Ijaz Ghani and I had a paper a few years ago where we, where we proposed a logic to do with intensity of space and so on, and so uh, 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 space intensity. Uh, and in fact, uh, uh, that might be something that might be useful to, to look at. And the final point I'd make on these studies is, uh, for some of the studies, we've used the te uh, telephone interviews type method. And I think from a methodological point of view, it would be good to have an assessment of those, uh, of those methods, which of course we have been used a lot in this, in this pandemic. And this might be a lens through which to see that. So that's my first, first point. The second point is that this crisis uh, in, its, in its present form will pass. Uh, but as Imran just said, the, second, the new waves are gonna be coming. But actually, there'll be other crises as well. And the, uh, the, a point that I've been making over the last few years is preparing for the next crisis. We don't know what it's going to be. We don't know when it's going to come. Uh, but what is it? Uh, how are we ready for it, uh, in, particularly in terms of protection, uh, protection of the poor uh, against the consequences of this thing? And we don't, want, we don't want to find ourselves again, as we found here in, in this case, that we're, we're scrambling to get things to, to get things uh, uh, in place. Uh, and I've, I've proposed in the past that what we should, we should be doing is looking ahead in some sense, imagining crises as they arise uh, and, and, and working through modeling the consequences of those uh, for the poor and then seeing what gaps there are in existing social protection systems through that mechanism. I call this a social protection assessment program and it's analogous to the financial sector assessment program, which of course is commonplace now. The FSAP is commonplace. What does the FSAP do? It imagines crises. It says, suppose in fact the tourist sector, tourism sector collapsed, then the banks which are linked to that and, and so on and so forth. It, it imagines financial uh, knock through effects. And my proposal is that we should be looking at this in the, in the same way, imagining crises and then follow, and modeling those and following through and seeing what gaps there are in the thing. And actually the World Bank has already started doing this uh, 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 developing something called stress testing, which, which is what I suggested some, some years ago uh, in the context of the financial crisis. The third and final point I would make is, uh, which is sort of, uh, in some sense, the, the biggest picture point, is that there seems to be a lot of bre breathless commentary just now on that nothing will ever be the same again, the role of the state has been clearly established, and so on and so forth. So going forward, uh, uh, we're going to be, in some sense, to a new normal uh, where, where the role of the state in this thing has been, will clearly have been recognized and so on. Well, having thought that 12 years ago at the time and argued that 12 years ago at the time of the financial crisis, uh, my, own reading of the, my own reading of the cycles of thought in, 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 in policy is that three, four years from now, we'll be back to the same debates uh, and we'll have to fight those fights all over again. There, there will be no easy, <laughs> there'll be no easy uh, uh, entry point because we had the because we had the COVID crisis and so on, uh, in the in, in the middle of the crisis, it seems as though things are moving in a particular direction. But certainly, my my writings on on broad cycles of thinking, cycles of policy move, suggest to me that three four years from now, just as three four years after the financial crisis, we'll be back to the fighting the fight on the role of the state 
in uh, in providing, particularly in providing social protection. So those those are my three points: the specifics on the on on the on these studies, uh, proximity, quantify, etc. Secondly, preparing for the next crisis, a social protection assessment program, uh, and thirdly, uh, cycles of thought. We shouldn't we shouldn't too readily think that we're off the hook in terms of uh, fighting the fight for the role of the state. And uh, there, there, there are papers behind each of these things, but I, but I, uh, and this is what I'll be trying to say in my in my contribution to the volume. Thank you, Kunal. Uh, thank you, Ravi. That was very clear, extremely inter interesting. In fact, another issue that you raised, we're going to pick up again in the second session, sec uh, six point one, uh, uh, Wednesday at five o'clock um, Helsinki time for everyone who's listening in. And I know that we don't have any time for Q and A, but I would like whoever wanted to ask questions to park those questions, take them to the second session, because we'll have more time, I think, Marty and Mike, for questions in that session, because there are fewer of, a, fewer of, a, of us presenting at that, in that session. I think the point really is just to conclude is that one thing is quite clear from the four presentations on a very different country context is the differentiated effects of the pandemic, exactly as Ravi and Imran also alluded to, very different across, even within the informal sector. And I think we could understand exactly how exactly that's happening, the mechanisms and the pathways, as, as Marty mentioned. The other thing that's interesting also is that we saw a different, the timeline is important. As lockdowns come and go, whether they're national, uh, they are local, uh, and so on, we see very different recovery processes and we see very different effects. Uh, and so I think we need to understand the timeline also very, very well, because it's unusual the way the, the pandemic has come and, come and gone, so to speak, in many countries. Uh, for example, I think Zilur Bangladesh is going through a lockdown or, or still uh, maybe came out of it recently. And we know that how these lockdowns are when they come and when they go, they're very different effects. And the second lockdown might even be more drastic in its effects than the first lockdown, for, for, for example. So I think those, that can be also need to understand in the book volume that you're going to try and put together. And I think the question about uh, looking to the future is very important. And that's exactly why we have this the next session. and and. Uh, um, and I, I would, again, encourage all of us who are attending the session to come back on Wednesday afternoon and to listen to all of the great set of presentations there. Let me stop here. Thank you so much, all of you. It was a really interesting session. And look forward to seeing all of us again, back again on Wednesday afternoon. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.